Before we get into this video about PSA responses, I just wanted to remind you that on March 11th, we're having a free prostate cancer patient and caregiver conference here in Los Angeles, California. We would love to see you. If you would like more information, click the link in the description below. Today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about PSA and the response to treatment. What should these numbers look like after someone's received a certain type of treatment? And I think that oftentimes, you know, the PSA being, it's used in different formats, you know, screening, and that's kind of what it's more well known for. But I don't think patients realize how critical the PSA number is to show whether a treatment is being uh, effective or not. And so it's different in every type of treatment of whether or not the PSA will respond right away or over time. And so I I think um, going through these different types of treatment will be beneficial. So the first one I'd like to start off with is like a first generation hormone therapy like Lupron or Firmagon. PSA responses after hormone therapy have been studied for 30 years and what we expect after someone starts hormone therapy and of course let's talk about the men that are newly diagnosed maybe they have a PSA of 5, 10 or 20 and they're starting on Lupron or Firmagon to try and um, enhanced cure rates, usually in combination with radiation. The PSA within the first month should generally drop about 90%. So if you're starting with a PSA of around 10, you would expect a PSA after one month to be down around one. And you'd like to see the PSA go to less than 0.1 within four or five months. This is a very important sequence because if the PSA doesn't drop down to less than 0.1 within four or five months, Something's wrong. That, that, that is an unusual type of prostate cancer that has some hormone resistance. And studies over and over have shown that the prognosis in those individuals, thankfully it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. The prognosis in those individuals is uh, for lower cure rates if they, uh, let's say they go on and have radiation and hope to be cured. Uh, their recurrence rates are gonna be much higher than the people who have their PSA drop to less than 0.1. We call that the PSA nadir. Certainly there's variations in how quickly PSA will decline and the decline of 90% after one month is just sort of a, a rough idea. What's really important is that the PSA gets down to less than 0.1 uh, within four or five months and outcomes in general are gonna be quite quite good in those individuals. So oftentimes I'm asked if Lupron, Firmagon, I think there's also Trellstar, like if there's one drug that works better than another in lowering PSA or are they all the same? Ultimately, they're all the same. Uh, Firmagon lowers testosterone immediately, and PSA declines will probably be more brisk than they will with Lupron. When I say 90% after a month, those are uh, large studies over many years done with Lupron, Eligard, Trellstar, the ones that have a, sl a slight flare in testosterone before they drop down to zero. With Firmagon, the decline in PSA would probably be quicker. I don't speculate that it outcomes or anti-cancer effect would be superior, but uh, Generally, we would think of these all as kind of one type of therapy. There are second generation medicines that are sometimes incorporated where you'll add Zytiga, Erlita, um, Nubeca, or Extandi, and quite possibly PSAs will decline, decline a little more briskly. But ultimately, the bottom line is that you wanna see the PSA get to less than 0.1 within four or five months. So it sounds like with the second generation hormone therapies, the PSA responds in the same way. Is that the same? Um, again, you know, it, when it comes to, we have Orgavix on the market, we have Nubeca, we have all these types of Zytiga, um, you know, is it the same where every drug is gonna lower PSA at the same rate or are there different? A lot of times I see patients kind of deciding between these second generation hormone therapies based off of side effects, not PSA response. So what is the PSA response like? Well, I think the PSA response is gonna be uniformly excellent. So I wouldn't base the selection of treatment on PSA response. I would base the selection of treatment on how serious the underlying disease is. Uh, is there any spread to the lymph nodes? Is it a Gleason score of nine or 10? Is the PSA over 20? When you have these higher metrics, then there's a greater chance of metastatic disease, and uh, we want to optimize cure rates by giving combination therapy. With combination therapy, you're going to have very, very few patients that don't get their PSA down to less than 0.1, the PSA nadir of 0.1, within four or five months. If such a situation were to occur, and I, the chances are less than 1%, uh, that indicates early hormone resistance, which is, rare, but a very serious development if it occurs. So PSA response really doesn't drive decision-making unless there's a high nadir. 
and high nadirs are uh, relatively uncommon, thankfully. So what about in cases of surgery? How fast should the PSA decline after surgery? That's a good question because people don't realize that if someone has an operation and their PSA is, say, six or seven, it will take about four weeks for the PSA to get out of the bloodstream. The PSA test is so sensitive, it can pick up very small amounts. And we want to see a PSA less than 0.1 or even 0.05 or even 0.02 if there's an ultra-sensitive assay being incorporated within about six weeks after the operation. I, I'm not a fan of surgery, but one of the advantages of surgery is that since you're clearing all PSA out of the system by removing the prostate, uh, we, the PSA becomes a very sensitive indicator of, of persistent cancer. So if it's above 0.02 or 0.03, one has to ask why. Is there some cancer left behind? Is there a little bit of prostate that was left behind? It's actually not easy to get the whole gland out consistently. And sometimes the surgeons will leave a little bit of normal prostate behind, and that can be detected with PSA as well. So if someone uh, has some detectable PSA after surgery, I wouldn't overreact immediately. I would keep checking it frequently. And if it remains very stable at say 0.03 or 0.05, then uh, possibly the surgeon just left a little bit of prostate gland behind. You can also look at the PATH report and see if the margins were positive. Did they cut through cancer when they removed the gland? And if so, that of course indicates maybe a higher risk that there's some cancer left behind, not just prostate. And if the PSA is steadily rising, of course, that is a conclusive indication that, the, uh, that there is some cancer left behind after surgery. So what about in different forms of radiation? Does the PSA going to decline based off of you know, beam radiation versus another? Is it all the same or is it based off the radiation itself? So the type of radiation doesn't make that big a difference. The issue with radiation is that in many cases they're getting hormone therapy and the decline in PSA is going to be based on a reaction to the hormone therapy, not to the radiation. When the radiation is administered without hormone treatment, it, people are often surprised at how slowly PSA levels decline. The PSA nadir, after say a seed implant or IMRT, SBRT, proton therapy, may not occur for up to two years after treatment has been administered. That seems really counterintuitive. I mean, here we're giving this really powerful treatment. People tend to envision the cancer being burned out with the radiation, but that's not what's happening. Radiation poisons the cancer cells, and then they slowly die off over, a, say, a one to two year period. And then the PSA will slowly decline during that time period. So I reassure patients a lot about this when uh, they come in six months after radiation and their PSA may be dropped from 10 down to two. And they express concern that maybe the cancer isn't completely controlled. I mean, shouldn't it all be gone by now? And the answer is no. Uh, as long as the PSA continues in a slow decline over time, we're perfectly happy. And if it doesn't arrive at a decent nadir, say within two years, then you can wonder if there's some persistent disease activity, maybe get a PSMA PET scan and look into it further. But the um, rate of decline is often quite slow. So now we're in an age where we're seeing focal therapies kind of come to light and I think a, new, a lot of new technology is coming up. How is the PSA going to respond to focal therapy if the entire prostate is left or maybe they're only radiating a spot? Like how does, what does that look like? It does complicate using PSA as a sole metric. We've been talking about surgery and radiation and how incredibly useful PSA is for tracking these people to make sure they got cured. And you can rely on PSA. A lot of people are surprised that, you know, that we don't need to do scans. Uh, a lot of other cancers, they have to keep doing scans, looking for cancer that might have spread. Take it to the bank. If the PSA is less than 0.1, there is not a prostate cancer problem, especially if the patients were off hormone therapy and their testosterone is recovered. Focally treated patients have normal, viable prostate tissue left behind, which makes PSA. And what I've seen with the focal patients who've undergone different types of therapy with laser or, or focal radiation or cryotherapy is a rather steep decline in PSA often. Let's say the PSA is six or seven from a cancer that's in the gland down to maybe one, two, or three. And then the PSA will level off at that level representing the PSA coming from the untreated prostate. So PSA is a monitoring tool 
for focal patients is not as accurate as it is for people who have their whole prostate treated. So we typically get an MRI once a year in our focally treated prostate patients to look at the untreated portion of the gland and make sure there's no new cancers coming along. Since the PSA can be used, I suppose, if it misbehaves in a bad way, but we wouldn't want to wait for things to get out of hand and we'll do regular scans to make sure that there's nothing new coming along. So we have this term called PSA density. Can you explain what it is and does it matter when it comes to focally treated patients? Interpretation of PSA almost always needs to be in the context of how much normal prostate tissue is left behind. And we can measure the volume of the prostate with ultrasound and MRI. And as we've talked about, you're looking at a 10 to 1 ratio between the number of cc's of viable untreated prostate. So let's say you have a 20 cc gland, that the average PSA with no cancer in, in, the, in the gland should be around 2. Divide 20 by, two, by 10, you get 2. That concept of PSA density should always be applied when people are trying to interpret, is the PSA too high? Because if someone has a lot of prostate tissue left behind, say they have a 60 cc gland, normal PSA is going to be around 6 with some up and down variations. PSA density uh, is somewhat useful for interpreting uh, PSA levels after focal therapy, but it is, in, our, in my opinion, probably not accurate enough in someone that's gone through a, uh, getting cured of cancer one time who's uh, now under close surveillance to make sure there's no new cancers. We don't rely on PSA alone. We'll typically get a 3T uh, multiparametric MRI once a year. So what should the PSA look like then in patients who are getting something like Provenge? You know, Provenge is an immunotherapy that's approved in prostate. In fact, it's the only immunotherapy that's approved in prostate cancer. And I think a lot of times I've seen patients kind of get frustrated, like, is it working? How do I know it's working? So how does PSA interact with that? PSA traditionally has always dropped in effective therapies. And Provenge and Zofigo, which is an injectable type of radiation, uh, neither of these treatments result in PSA declines after therapy, and yet studies have shown that the people who are treated with these treatments live longer than the people who are not treated with these treatments. And the best example I come up with are vaccinations. When we undergo a vaccination, uh, we don't know if it's going to save our lives, but we know from large studies that the vaccinated people die less frequently than the ones who are unvaccinated. And it is determined by large trials of, of randomized blinded trials where large numbers of people are, are given either a sham treatment or a real treatment and then monitored over time. And that's why the FDA approved Provenge and uh, Zofigo to prolong life in people with prostate cancer. Why don't we see a PSA decline? Well, if uh, an immune therapy, which changes your immune system permanently and in, empowers the immune system to continue fighting those cancer cells daily for the rest of your life, even though the treatment's given over six weeks, it changes your immune system permanently, you can envision how it could retard or slow down the progression of the cancer in a meaningful way, such that treated people would live longer, but not necessarily stop the progression of the disease altogether. They've done this, uh, these types of studies in people who are getting chemotherapy with things like Taxotere and Jeftana, who uh, after becoming resistant to the treatment, that means their PSAs are going up even though the, the treatment has been continued. We're saying they've be developed chemotherapy resistance. If you divide them into two groups and you stop the chemotherapy in the in one group and you continue the chemotherapy even though the PSA is rising, the group that gets continued therapy lives longer than the group that doesn't get continued therapy. What's going on is that the chemotherapy is retarding some of the cells but not all of them and that is still advantageous for the patients and leads to longer survival. So you mentioned Zofigo, which is a uh, FDA-approved drug that you know soaks up radium-223 into bone mets. And to my thought process, it's kind of like, okay, well, if it's eliminating bone mets, why would the PSA not respond? So how do you show or you know, what do we use to show that Zofigo is effective? Sometimes we will see PSA declines, but it's not common. We have seen PSA declines with Provenge. Uh, there's a nether enzyme that comes from the uh, bones called alkaline phosphatase, which has been shown to decline in Zofigo responses. But I think the problem is kind of similar to what I already described, in that the, since the Zofigo only treats the bone met metastasis, it's not covering all the disease in the body. Lymph nodes are not treated, lung, liver, if there's disease anywhere else. 
So you are getting rid of some of the cancer effectively and efficiently, but not all of it. And for that reason, uncontrolled cancer in the lymph nodes is still going to grow and cause a rise in PSA. So when it comes to chemotherapies, you know, we have Jevtana, we have Taxotere. A lot of patients have asked me, you know, are they the same? Are they different? And also, um, you know, what is the effect on PSA? So I think the effect on PSA and the anti-cancer effect has clearly been established to be equivalent. Uh, there are some studies that suggest that Jevtana has fewer side effects and may be a little more desirable for that reason. When we start off in either of these chemotherapies, we expect the PSA to at least stabilize after two injections. So you're, the injections are given every three weeks. So if you've had the second injection and maybe a couple weeks after that, and the PSA has not at least slowed in its rise or hopefully stabilized or even better started to decline, that's a sign that the chemotherapy is not working. So PSA is a very great indicator as to whether or not you're on the right track with this type of treatment. Now before I talked about continuing chemotherapy even if the PSA is rising and that would be a scenario only if there are no other options and this, these days usually we have a lot of other options. So we want to always be switching in a timely fashion to uh, treatments that are effective, not, uh, not just giving something on and on when it's not optimal. So yes, there's still some value in continuing it, but there may be other better treatments. So we try and, uh, and evaluate the PSA every time patients come in for their infusions, every three weeks, and we expect to start to see an effect on PSA after the second cycle. So what about with Pluvicto or Lutetium-177? You know, this was just FDA approved in 2021. It's a newer treatment, but what is the effect, or what effect does it have on the PSA? I would say that the policies are very similar, although the treatments are given on a six-week cycle instead of a three-week cycle. It's an injection that after the second cycle, we would expect some, at least some stabilization in PSA, if not uh, the beginnings of a decline. The thinking in general is that if you're not getting some favorable impact on PSA after the second cycle, that maybe you need to move on to a different treatment. Today we're talking about how PSA responds to different types of treatment. Oftentimes we think about PSA and we think about it maybe screening for prostate cancer, but it's really important to know that PSA responds differently to each treatment that you decide, or sometimes it doesn't respond at all. But sometimes even if it doesn't respond at all, it's good to know that maybe we need to do other measures to see whether the treatment is effective or not. Or even the timeline, if it's in within surgery within one month, or within radiation, which should be within two years. The variances matter as you're deciding, and it's important to know that as you're you know, going into these doctor's offices and having these discussions with your physician. We don't want you to be caught off guard. We want you to be as educated as you can so that you can develop the plan you need should a treatment work for you or not. If you would like more information about prostate cancer or any of the treatments that we talked about, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and reach out to our helpline if you need uh, your questions answered with your individual case. Please like this video if you found it helpful. And if you have comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. And please remember, most of all, you're not alone. I hope you have a great week. Thank you.